Thank you so much, Bill, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is a real treat. I, um, at the risk of, of showing my age, and I'm, I must be a lot older than you are, Bill, <laughs> people talk about how you form your taste in music, you know, your favorite songs or things you loved as a teenager, and they always stay with you. For some of us, that might be true about politics, too, because when I was in junior high school in 1966, my, my st our teacher took a student teacher took a bunch of us down to the local TV station when they used to post the results coming in uh, like a chalkboard or something um, and Wood TV 8 for some of us in the audience who still know that station um, and that was the year of it would have been two years after the Goldwater debacle that was the year of names that have always stuck with me in sort of models of leadership. And they were like Romney, Scranton, Brooke, Percy, Hatfield. Historians in the room could probably add to that. But they were all elected for the first time or re-elected in 1966. And, um, and I think I must have heard about the Ripon Society somehow in that connection at that time. They always kind of look forward to being here. This is a, it's a weird thing to say, I know, but it, it's... Um, it, Ripon has stood for something, although Arthur Vandenberg would have said that it should have been the Jackson Society because the GOP really was founded in Jackson, Michigan. <laughs> 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 but, um, that may not play well today. Uh, but anyway, Arthur Vandenberg may be the most important political figure of the 20th century for whom there was no biography. And that was, he didn't live long enough to write his memoir, and he'd been a newspaper reporter and publisher. And, capable writer, um, and no, and nor did a couple of would-be biographers, one of whose papers I actually inherited, which gave me a sense of mission, and it still took me uh, more than 20 years to, 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 to finish it. But um, he was also, Vandenberg was also a hero worshiper, and Alexander Hamilton was his hero. He wrote three books about Hamilton before he went to the Senate, before before Vandenberg went to the Senate in 1928, uh, none of which were optioned for theatrical production, much to his dismay. But uh, he went to the Senate as a as a Republican when Michigan was a Grand Rapids was a Republican city. Michigan was a Republican state, and really much of the U.S. outside the North or outside the South was Republican. Uh, but then comes the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression, and uh, he finds himself a, a, a Republican on the outside looking in throughout the Roosevelt administration, and in fact um, emerges as a, a very bitter rival of FDR's. And well, the one thing he did achieve uh, early on in the New Deal, coming out of the banking crisis in Detroit, he realized the fragility of the nation's banking system. And <laughs> against the wishes first of President Hoover and then of President Roosevelt, pushed for savings deposit insurance, feeling that was the best way to restore confidence in the banks. And so the FDIC was really his brainchild, although when it worked, and I argue it might be the most effective measure of, of the New Deal, um, Roosevelt was happy to take credit for it. But Vandenberg's mantra was always, I'm a nationalist. And he was, he had, he was of a generation that had been disillusioned by the experience of World War I, World War I, as Woodrow Wilson famously said, was going to make the world safe for democracy, and instead the aftermath of World War I sowed the seeds for, for future discord and ultimately war in Europe. And so with his distrust of FDR and his disillusion with World War I, he emerged as one of the, the leaders of the isolationist movement in the United States Senate. And so um, helped engineer the um, the Neutrality Act in 1937. There was an arms embargo provision there, saying that we are not going to uh, we are not going to sell arms to to belligerents in, in the event of war. Um, for those of you who may have seen that recent Churchill movie, Darkest Hour, mm -hmm. there's that there's a scene. It's it's not a true scene, but there's a scene where Churchill is on the phone with Roosevelt, pleading with him to release some arms that the British had ordered. And you can picture it, it would have been Vandenberg leading the fight in the Senate to prevent that from happening. Then Pearl Harbor happens, and the um, and that shows we're no longer safe behind our, our ocean moats. And you could say isolation has, isolation has ended there, but it really just tamped down the discussion during the war. 
And so, in 1943, the Republicans, who, who've been out of power now for more than a decade, and in 1940, because Vandenberg and Robert Taft and so much of the party was identified so much as isolationist, um, Wendell Wilkie was able to come in and sweep to the nomination. And of course, his attitude toward um, uh, intervention in Europe was not not too dissimilar from Roosevelt's. Uh, so as the Republicans are looking ahead to 1944, we're in the middle of the war, and they are split down the middle between the Taft forces who are uh, isolationist and want nothing to do with, um, with uh, treaties and foreign entanglements after World War II, and, uh, and the Wilkie adherents who are talking about ideas of world federalism and, and uh, world police force and things like that. And so Vandenberg, the RNC chair, asked Vandenberg to chair a policy committee to find a, a, a platform that the Republicans could run on in 44. And that means getting those two wings of the party together. And they have a conference up at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island in northern Michigan in, in September of 43. And they emerge from there uh, Vandenberg, um, Vandenberg loved sort of the art of compromise, and he said, uh, and that they came, they emerged from there with a statement very benign, but in favor of some form of post war organization, what would become the United Nations. And this was at a time when the Democrats weren't saying anything. People like William Fulbright and, and a lot of Democrats were introducing resolutions in, in the House or in the Senate, and Roosevelt would quash them. And probably rightfully so. He didn't want to start calling for post-war plans that might alienate our Russian allies, who had obvious designs on Eastern Europe, and, or alienate our British allies, who hoped to reclaim their empire. And so he was suppressing democratic discussion of post-war plans. And so Vandenberg suddenly finds himself speaking out in favor of the idea of the UN ahead of the Democrats. And that makes him that pulls him along, out partially out of his isolationism. Hmm. And then after, um, and then toward the end of the war, Roosevelt realizes he doesn't want to make the mistake that Woodrow Wilson made after World War I, when he had no Republicans of any stature on the American <coughs> delegation that, that Wilson led to Versailles to negotiate the, the Versailles Treaty, the post-war, the peace treaties after World War I. Roosevelt realized, I got it named Vandenberg. I don't like the guy, but I can't not have him on the delegation to uh, to San Francisco in the in the summer of 1945 to organize the UN. And this is in March and early April of 45, and then Roosevelt dies. And that six-member delegation, uh, three Democrats, three Republicans, two Democrats, two Republicans from Congress, and then um, a, a Republican boy wonder governor from Minnesota by the name of Harold Stassen and uh, the president of Barnard College, Virginia Gildersleeve, that's the, the six person delegation, represent the U.S. at the founding of the United Nations. And the, uh, and so Roosevelt dies, and he'd been his own State Department to a large degree anyway. Uh, the, I was, I was at the, new museum of American diplomacy that's just opening at the State Department, and they had a big picture of Democratic Secretary of State Cordell Hull. But during World War II, it wasn't Cordell Hull who was meeting with Stalin and Churchill, it was Harry Hopkins dispatched from the White House. And there aren't any Harry Hopkins pictures at the State Department Diplomacy Center, because it was you know, outside the purview of state. And so they had a young Secretary of State named Edward Stettinius, who was a capable enough manager, but not a diplomat. Um, and so Vandenberg gets to San Francisco, and I would argue in front of this, um, this group uh, that it was actually Republicans who represented the U.S. at the formation of the United Nations, because Vandenberg was the strongest member of, of those six delegates, and he brought along as his advisor a fellow named John Foster Dulles, who of course would later be Eisenhower's Secretary of State, 
and also was assisted by the Under Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs, Nelson Rockefeller, who <coughs> lined up all the votes of the Latin American delegates, who were the single largest bloc with so many countries in Europe, but war still going on. So, so many countries in Europe are, are occupied or have been a part of the Axis powers, and other parts of the world are still colonies that the Latin American votes were crucial to um, what the UN Charter would look like. And so it was those three who arguably were the pivotal folks in dealing with Molotov and Gromyko and, the, and the, the Russians. And Vandenberg made sure the word justice was inserted in the UN Charter because it was something that could, in that case, hold the Soviet Union to um, later on hold their feet to the fire and some of the promises they made and weren't keeping in uh, places like Poland. Um, so Vandenberg finds himself, instead of being on the outside looking in, being in the forefront of American foreign policy making. And Truman is both, like Vandenberg, a creature of the Senate and knows he needs Vandenberg's support to, to approve any post-war treaties. And they have a mutual respect for one another. And so that's when bipartisan cooperation really kicks into high gear. And uh, Truman comes to the Senate and talks about the need to provide emergency aid to Greece and Turkey when the British are no longer able to, can no longer afford to, to support those governments against um, Soviet intimidation in the case of Turkey and, and guerrilla activity in the case of Greece. Um, that's where Vandenberg may or may not have said, because there's no evidence of it, but it catches some of the spirit uh, when Truman is asking for his support in the Senate for eight degrees in Turkey and what becomes the Truman Doctrine of supporting free peoples against, um, against subversion. Um, said, you know, uh, you, you, President Truman, have got to scare the hell out of the American people if you want our support. We're not gonna just carry your water. You've gotta make a convincing case to the American people. And uh, after the Truman Doctrine comes the Marshall Plan, and Vandenberg worked so closely on that because in 46 he becomes chair of the Foreign Relations Committee when, when Republicans regain the majority. Um, Vandenberg and Marshall worked so closely that um, Marshall said it could have been called the Vandenberg Plan, because I think his exact quote was uh, when it got to Congress, Van was just the whole show. Um, and Vandenberg hold, held what may still be the most exhaustive hearings ever held on Capitol Hill, uh, listening to every side and, and every constituent interest involved in the Marshall Plan. And then came NATO, because economic redevelopment of Europe, crucial as it was, wasn't sufficient for post-war security with, with the Red Army uh, being the, the, the dominant military force on the continent. And so, um, when the European Union approaches, or the European community approaches um, the U.S. and said, we'd like you to join with us in a post-war security treaty, which for Vandenberg was a renunciation of everything he believed in about no foreign entanglements, um, he typed out the, res the enabling resolution uh, in, in his apartment on, in the Wardman Towers on Connecticut Avenue. Um, and that really reflected the, the belief he had come to in the importance of collective security. And that became the dominant spirit, that and the notion that we have to work in a bipartisan way of his last years. And shortly after the 48 Republican convention in Philadelphia, um, for which he wrote, he, he, he never, he, he always wanted to be president. Uh, he tried a little bit in 1940, and then with the break, outbreak of war in Europe, his isolationism was basically uh, left him very, <clears throat> looking very vulnerable and, and very backward looking. Um, in 48, he had risen to such stature that he was kind of hoping he might be drafted, but he didn't seek the nomination. Um, Thomas Dewey, of course, got it again, although Vandenberg did carry around his acceptance speech just in case it was going to happen. Um, but shortly after that, he was diagnosed with a, a spot on his lung that proved to be cancer. Um, and at that time, after this sequence from 1945 to 1949, when, these, when, when basically the post-war structure was put in place, um, 
the the uh, Republican loss in '48, uh, the rise of uh, Joe McCarthy and his attacks on communists and the government, the the civil war in China resulting in a communist victory and and in recriminations in the U.S. about who lost China, all of that ate away at the bipartisanship that Vandenberg had worked so hard for. Uh, and he was, uh, he died, he, he left the scene in Washington in um, early 1950 and then died uh, in Grand Rapids in 1951. And, but I just was going to read a couple of quotes of that, that um, in 1947, Look Magazine did a profile of him, and he had, at that point, um, chairing foreign relations. He's also vice president. Uh, he's president pro tem of the Senate, and in the absence of the vice president, is using the vice president's office and the vice president's Cadillac, and um, was was <laughs> sufficient stature that um, that a lot of people thought he should be president, including some Democrats. And, and William Fulbright um, famously suggested that. I think at that point, the succession had just been reorganized. I may have this wrong, but suggested that in the absence of a vice president, Truman should appoint Vandenberg Secretary of State, and then Truman should resign so Vandenberg could be president. And forever after, Truman called um, William Fulbright Senator Halfbright. Um, but, uh, but there was that kind of bipartisan respect for it. But that was the time when, when Look Magazine said it might take a whirling dervish to follow the pros and cons of Vandenberg's Senate votes over the past 18 years. That Vandenberg has whirled as the American people have whirled. Or as one of his fellow senators put it, Van changes his mind about as often as the average American, but slightly earlier. And I think there's just a little hint of genius in but slightly earlier. I mean, he wasn't a visionary, but, in, but he also wasn't so far in front that he didn't have followers. He was able to... to, to reflect the concerns of people struggling to find a role for America in the world after the war. And, um, and Bill was mentioning how his, his, um, his fame, if you will, was eclipsed by any number of things. Uh, not only did, was there no biography uh, or autobiography, but President Ford, who <coughs> Vandenberg um, quietly endorsed in a primary challenge to an isolationist incumbent in Grand Rapids in uh, 1948, um, and who, 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 for whom Vandenberg was a hero, um, that even locally in Grand Rapids, Ford eclipsed Vandenberg. And, and then when Vandenberg died, um, his, the flags were lowered over the Capitol, and, but it was the same day that Truman had just fired MacArthur, and the McMire MacArthur, Return General MacArthur, came to the Capitol to address a joint session of Congress and talked famously about old soldiers never dying, just fading away, um, and that made all the news. And so, uh, but that week, and, I, and I'll close with, with, with this, Edward R. Murrow uh, in his uh, CBS radio broadcast said, um, and this is now McCarthy era times, we are now divided bitterly, hysterically, had, he, then he said of Vandenberg, had he lived, he would have gloried in this conflict and steadied it. And he would have been confident that at the end of the day, little men of loud voice and small faith will yield to the collective judgment of the American people. And that was, that was how he came to be regarded. And I'd love to have a chance to, to talk with you about stuff. I brought along one little prop that Vandenberg's grandson gave me as I was working on this book. And back in... Um, I don't know how fashionable it was in the 40s or 50s, but to have a plaque on your desk if you were a senator. But of course, Harry Truman had that famous one, the buck stops here. Um, and maybe particularly for a Rip on Society audience, this is appropriate uh, in this current political climate because Vandenberg on his desk had one that's kind of hard to read, but it says, and this too shall pass. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, thank you very much. This is just fascinating and so timely, and it feels like everything old is new again in some ways. And, um, you know, when you talked about him being a, a whirling dervish, I was thinking the term flip-flopper, you know, mm -hmm. and how our politicians are not allowed to change their minds or opinions. And um, just also how he would respond to things that are going on today. And I guess you've probably really come to know the man 
through writing his biography. And so I'm just curious, what would you say were like his greatest strengths and his greatest weaknesses? And what would he bring to bear in history today? <laughs> wow. Um, the, thank you. The, um, when it talked, you're right, he was accused of being a, a flip-flopper. Um, and the, his opponents tried to peg that on him. But he was tending to flip and flop where public, in the direction of public opinion was flipping and flopping. So I think that saved him. But he was a he was a fan of um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and Emerson has a famous his famous essay "Self Reliance," where where he talks about speak what you believe today in hard words, and tomorrow um, speak in hard words what you believe, even if it contradicts everything you said yesterday or something like that. And, and that's that. I mean, there are a lot of more politically sophisticated people in this room than I am. But that notion that as conditions change or as your understanding of things change, um, you are required, we want you to change your mind, um, seems to have completely gone out of fashion because you're going to be pilloried for uh, something that you said uh, not just yesterday, but, but many years ago. And uh, I think he was always haunted, and that always was one reason why um, uh, I think as a senator, he realized he'd have a weakness in running for president because he'd had taken <laughs> votes on so many issues that everybody could find something they disagreed with at some point. Um, his strength was that he somehow saw, he saw it just as a simple requirement of his job to compromise. And he seemed to be capable of doing that well, adhering to what he saw as his principles, that, that compromise was an honorable activity. Um, weaknesses, he had an enormous ego and uh, could be played to. And so um, I think one of the reasons that he's, he's been somewhat dismissed is that the, the maybe the greatest um, first person account of those poor four years of Marshall Plan and NATO is um, Dean Acheson's memoir, Present at the Creation. And Dean Acheson, of course, was Truman, the Secretary of State after Marshall. And uh, he was a wonderful writer, but tended with Vandenberg and even with Marshall to be a little bit condescending. And so he would, so, so um, Acheson, in his view, the State Department would craft this brilliant legislation for you know what, whether it was related to the European Recovery Act or the Marshall Plan or to, or to NATO, and and we'd send it to Vandenberg and his ego. He'd have to put his stamp on it and make changes um, just so that he could make it his own, which could be kind of a weakness. Except the flip side of that was Vandenberg knew a lot more than Atchison did about what it would take to get something through Congress, and so there was a line where. He had um, changed some language in a, in, a, in a piece of legislation, and a, um, one of his colleagues came to him and said, I, you know, I don't know what this means. And Vandenberg said, well, don't worry about it. I can go to 10 other senators and say, I heard what you said, and I've incorporated it in this statement. <laughs> and that, that you know, <laughs> willingness to, to sort of patiently integrate other people's ideas, I think, um, really paid off. And so. Um, his, his weakness in his early years was I think he was stuck in a pattern of thinking in his isolationism that was proving more and more untenable and he found himself stuck there um, both because he was too slow to change his mind and because he was so distrustful of Roosevelt that um, if Roosevelt was doing it I'm, I'm suspicious of this and I'm not going to go along. And, um, you know, while there might have been a lot of reasons to be distrustful of Roosevelt, um, you know, in the eyes of history, I think Roosevelt had a pretty good idea of how America should be responding to a world situation.